Good to see each one of you tonight. Uh, I think we're mostly home folks here tonight, just in case we do have a visitor. Uh, if you are a guest with us tonight, I hope you got a bulletin. Please fill out the welcome tab and drop it in the offering plate. But let's go to the Lord and ask his blessing on our time of worship. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here tonight. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints. We thank you, Lord, for the op opportunity to just raise our uh, voices in songs of praise and to come to you in prayer and in the proclamation of your word. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would touch uh, our hearts tonight, that you would visit your people, and, Lord, that we would be strengthened for the coming week. We give you glory, praise, and honor in all that is done. We ask that you would be lifted up in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first song this evening is hymn number 348 in your hymn book, Living for Jesus. Let's stand as we sing.
few moments to reach out and shake hands with your neighbor. time as we sing it. Come the found, come the king, come the precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come the found of our blessing. Amen. You may be seated. And for our offertory hymn, which you may remain seated for, uh, be hymn number 414, Because I Have Been Given Much. And I think uh, we don't often sing it in terms of Memorial Day, but remembering all those that have died in service so that we can have what we have today in terms of our country, uh, because we have been given much, we too should give and serve in other ways as well. So think about that as we sing this song today. Because I have been given much, I too must give. Because of thy great bounty, Lord, each day I live. I shall divide my gifts with thee, with every brother that I see, who has the need of help from me. Because I have been sheltered, fed by thy good care. I cannot see another's lack and I not share. My glowing fire, my loaf of bread, my roof safe shelter overhead. That he too may be comforted. Because love has been lavished so upon me, Lord. How wealth I know that was not meant for me to hold. I shall give love to those in need, shall show that love by word and deed. Thus shall my thanks be thanks indeed.
Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn over to the book of Acts, the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 9. Chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. I want to speak to you on the subject tonight of how to know God's will. How to know God's will. Now, if you were to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord, let's say at some point you were taken up to heaven or the Lord appeared to you and offered you the opportunity to speak with Him face-to-face, -face, what would be one of the things that you would want to ask Him? What question would you have for Him? I know at least some of us, our question for him would be, Lord, what would you have me do? What is your will for my life? What, what do you desire of me? Now that experience, that very experience, was the experience of Saul, or we know him as the Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 9 tonight. And that is exactly what he asks, that very question, Lord... What would you have me do? Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, tre he trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. And Lord, we ask that we would hear from you tonight, that you would speak to our hearts, that Lord, that we would receive your word with gladness, and that we would receive direction and guidance, and that you would be glorified through our lives more richly because of what we have heard tonight. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Now, in this passage, the Apostle Paul asks two very important questions. In fact, I would argue that the two most important questions that any person can ever ask. The very first question he asks is, who are you, Lord? When he encounters Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, glorified, he asks him, who are you, Lord? Now that is the single most important question in all of life. Of the two questions Paul asks, that is the most important essential. And notice, Paul even answers his own question. He says, who are you, Lord? Lord, who is Jesus Christ to you? Because the truth is, he is Lord. He is the one who is our ruler, our owner. He is our sovereign. Is Jesus Christ for you tonight your Savior and your Lord, the one who directs your life, who guides your life. That word Lord implies ownership. It means that he is your master. Is Christ your master? The early Christians were brought before magistrates, and they were commanded to declare that Caesar was Lord, that Caesar was their owner, their master, their director. They were supposed to declare that Caesar was Curios, the Lord and master of their lives. But they could not in good conscience do that because they knew that the only Lord, the only master that was truly the ruler of their lives was Christ himself. So instead of declaring that Caesar was Lord, they would declare boldly, Christus Curios, Christ is Lord. And they were put to death because they said that. Who is Lord of your life tonight? Who is it that is the director of your life? The, the one for whom you live your life? Because I guarantee you there's something in your life, either a person or a thing in your life, that is the Lord of your life, that is your master. For some people it's money. 
For some people, it's prestige or power or fame. For some people, it's family. For some people, it's a relationship. For some people, it's sex or drugs. What is it that masters your life? What is it that directs your life? Is it pleasure? Is it, is it uh, your job? Is, what is it that is the, the guiding force in your life? Because your answer, your answer quite often will determine your eternity. Saul settles this right here. He says, whoever you are, you're Lord. You're Lord. Then comes the second question. You see, once we settle that first question, that Christ is Lord. Who are you, Christ? Who are you, God? You are my Lord. You are my sovereign. You are my master. Once you've settled that question, that Christ is Lord, the next question follows quite naturally and is almost as important. What now would you have me to do? What would you have me to, be, to do as my master and my Lord? What would you have me to do? And that's what Paul says here. He says, you are Lord. What now would you have me to do? And Christ's response is to him to get up and go to the city of Damascus. And there he'll be told what to do in verse 6. Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now, I think it is interesting and instructive for us that when Paul says, Lord, what would you have me to do? Jesus does not say, well, that's for me to know and you to figure out. He does not say, well, that is a great puzzle and you'll have to meditate on that for a while. And if you're really fortunate, you may come to the right conclusion. He says, get up, go to the city, and you'll be told. You know what that indicates to me? God wanted him to know what his will was for his life. God wanted Paul to know what it was he had been put on this earth for. God desires that you know his will for your life as well. God desires that you know why you have been placed here. God's will is not some, some secret that you have to enter into some sort of mystical, mystical experience to come to the conclusion of what it is. You, you go to Christian... Uh, uh, bookstores and, and uh, go online and look at Christian, Christian books, you will find all kinds of books. I have volumes, libraries that have been written on how to discern God's will, how to know God's will. Here's a little secret, folks. God wants you to know what His will is. He wants, he's not hiding it from you. He's not hiding it from you. God desires that we know what His will is for our life. Now, there are three ways, though, that we understand God's will. So before we get into exactly how we can discern what God's will is, uh, we have to understand that when we talk about the will of God, theologians talk about God's will really in, in three different aspects. The first is what so the uh, theologians call the sovereign or decretive will of God. And that sounds really fancy, but all it means is that there are certain things that God just decrees will be. God decrees that certain things will happen. And when God decrees that something happens, it will happen. It will happen. For instance, we know that Christ is going to return for his church. We know that's going to happen. God has decreed it. Nothing can stand in the way of it. It's going to happen. In the end, God wins. It is God's will. He has decreed it. It will happen. He is the sovereign king of kings. And what God decrees will happen. There's another way in which we speak of God's will, though, and that is God's preceptive will, and that refers to his law and his commandments, and the precepts that he gives us. God says, listen, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. These are precepts that he has given us, and although God has, has willed that we do these things, we have the right, we have the right to break those and pay the penalty for it. So we can break those, those uh, commandments, these precepts that he has given us. But there's a third way in which we understand God's will, and this is the one that we really want to get to tonight, and that is God's particular will for you. His particular will for your life. And God does have a particular will for your life. God does have a will for what you are to be about in your life. God reveals that to, to uh, a man by the name of Ananias concerning Saul. 
In Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he, has cho he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. This is God's particular will for Paul, for Saul. This is God's will. He will be the one who will bear Christ's name before the Gentiles. He will be the apostle to the Gentiles. And in doing that, it is God's will that he will suffer many things for Christ's name's sake. That's God's will for Paul. Now, folks, there are some aspects of God's will that are very specific, that are particular to you. But there are some aspects of God's will that are universal. It is God's will, His preceptive will, that you come to know Christ as your Savior. God calls all of us to, to know Christ as their Savior. He calls all of us to receive the free gift of salvation. He calls all of us to repentance. Someone comes to me and says, I, I don't know what God's will is for my life. What's God's will for my life? I can tell you right now. His will for your life is that you receive the free gift, the salvation that Christ offers you. That's, that's what he says. It's not his will that any should perish, but all come to salvation. So I can tell you that part for everybody, everybody that's here tonight. But having said that, then there are certain very specific things, more particular things that God has in mind for you. And he desires... For instance, that uh, uh, each one of us work at something. He desires that we, we hold a job. He desires that we do something productive. Uh, I remember when Becky and I first moved to Louisville, Kentucky. We, uh, we moved there, and Becky was looking for a job. She was talking to a recruiter who was helping her find a job. And I remember she sat down across from this recruiter, and she said, Now, my husband is a Southern Baptist pastor. So here, while I work here in Louisville, I can't do anything that has to do with alcohol or gambling or tobacco. And the guy looked at her and said, well, you came to the wrong town. Yeah. Well, the fact is that God had something for her. <laughs> it just wasn't in alcohol, tobacco, or gambling. Fortunately, they make pizza there too, so that worked out good for us. God has a, a will, a specific will for your life. He, he desires that, uh, uh, that you accomplish what he has put you on this earth for. And he has given you certain gifts, certain spiritual gifts to empower you to accomplish the ministry that he's entrusted to you. God loves you and knows you. We can look at the vastness of the universe and sometimes we're overawed. We are just amazed at how vast the universe is, how many people there are on the face of this planet, billions of people, and yet God knows how many hairs are on your head. God knows you intimately and has a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, when we begin to seek God's will for our life, this particular plan for, for our life, let me just point out that... Uh, there are some myths that people hold on to about God's will that I want to explode tonight. And the first myth that, that we need to, uh, to do away with is this idea that God is going to give you a road map. And some people think, well, you know, what I want is for God to sit down and just give me a road map and say, well, okay, now, now when you turn 24, I want you to move to this place and you'll buy this house and do this job. And then when you, when you finally get to uh, 36, you're going to do this. And it, people want God to say, okay, I want to give you this road map of, of what you're going to do and just write it out for us. The fact is God does not give us a road map. What he gives us is a relationship. He says, listen, you want to know the will for your life. You want to know what I want you to do. Walk closely with me. I will take your hand. Walk closely with me, and I will walk you through it. I will walk you through it. He does not give us a road map. He gives us a relationship. Draw close to me, and I will draw close to you. And as closer we draw to Christ, the more clearly we see his will. People will ask, well, pastor, how do I discern God's will? The best way to discern God's will is to draw as close as you can to Christ. 
Because the closer you are to him, the more clearly you'll see what he desires for you in your life. The second thing is a myth is that, that if we submit to God's will for our life, that we're never going to have any fun. That God is just this cosmic killjoy. And I have talked to people that said, well, you know, I'd love to be, I'd love to be a Christian. I'd love to, to, to know that I have heaven and eternal life. But, you know, uh, I, I just don't want to give up all the fun I have. Folks, if you know Christ as your personal Savior, the Bible says that He will give you joy unspeakable. He will give you joy. There is a joy in the Christian life. There's a joy in the fellowship of the saints. You know, the best, best times I've ever had have been with brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to find our joy, to find our, our uh, gladness, to find our, our delight in Christ. John Piper says we are to be Christian hedonists, finding our joy and our delight in our relationship with Christ. Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Myth number three is that God only speaks to certain very few people. God really only reveals His will to those super saints out there. You know, they're, they're, they're Billy Graham's. Billy Graham may know God's will for his life, but I can't know my will, God's will for my life. You know, uh, uh, D.L. Moody may have known God's will for his life, the great evangelist, but, you know, I can't know God's will for my life. Maybe, the God's, maybe God speaks to the preacher, but he doesn't speak to me. fact is, God desires that you know, your, know his will for your life. You don't have to be some super saint for God to direct and guide you. All we need to do is to choose to follow him and to walk as closely as we can by him. Another myth is that if you are going to discern God's will for your life, that you have to have a supernatural Damascus Road experience like Saul. That I, I have to have an experience where God speaks to me audibly, where there's this dramatic supernatural experience. That's just not true. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk in just a moment about the ways that God reveals His will to us. And He does that mir miraculously sometimes as He did in Saul's life. But most of the time, most of the time, God reveals His will to us in some very normal, common ways. Another myth is that God only reveals His will to young people. God has a will for the young people, but you know, at my age, God's just not going to speak to me anymore. Folks, if you go through the Bible, I'm just amazed at how many times God spoke to men and women who were well along in the years. Caleb at 85 took Mount Hebron. When uh, Abraham was 75, God first promised him a son. At 80, God spoke to Moses in the burning bush. God is not finished with you. God is not finished with you. Don't retire on God. Because God gets ready for you to retire. When, he's, when he gets to the point where he is done with your work in this world, he'll take you to heaven. Don't retire on God. Don't retire on God. He's not finished with you yet. Finally, another myth that people subscribe to is that God's will is hidden for us. And, and we, have to, we have to discover it in some supernatural way. Folks, God's will is not some cosmic Easter egg hunt. God desires that you know His, your, His will for your life. Now, having put these myths aside, I think we can outline some very easy steps that will lead us to how we can discover the will of God. And the first is that we need to understand that God's will is provisional. That is to say, God expects certain things from us before we're going to receive anything from Him. And the first thing is that we need to be willing to obey Him. Saul was willing to obey God's will. When God said, go to Damascus, Saul went to Damascus. One of the problems I see in, in our lives is that we just aren't willing to do what God has told us anyway. 
Why should God reveal His will to somebody He knows isn't going to do it? We need to be sold out to do what God has called us to do. He needs to be our Lord and our Master. And uh, unfortunately, we have other lords, other masters that we are more devoted to following than God. So until we put those aside and make Christ our Lord and our Master, we needn't think that we're going to receive anything from the Lord. Secondly, we need to be meek and teachable. Because the Bible says that God resists the proud. In Psalm 25, verse 9, it says, The humble He guides in justice, and the humble He teaches His way. We need to be humble, we need to be teachable, we need to be meek, we need to be submissive to the Lord God. We also need to be open to hearing from Him. Earnestly and sincerely seek God's guidance. We need to come to Him in prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Come to God in prayer. Seek His face. Ask Him, what is my assignment from you, Lord? Earnestly seek His will for your life. Consider the example of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16. Uh, verse 6 says, Now when he had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go in Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And what impresses me about that story is that the Apostle Paul is not sitting back, twiddling his thumbs, waiting for God to give him a direction. He's already busy doing something for the Lord. Now, God may be closing doors right and left, but at least he is out there seeking God's will. We have, we have got to be about doing God's will. We've got to be actively seeking it. We've got to be involved in serving the Lord. We're much more likely to discover God's will for our life if we are actively stepping out in faith, seeking His guidance and direction. When the Israelites <clears throat> had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and were finally directed to enter into the promised land, the Bible tells us that they lined up, they formed up in camps by... Uh, by the tribes and the priests took the, the Ark of the Covenant and they put it on their, the, their shoulders using the rods that were run through the holes in the, the Ark of the Covenant and they marched towards the Jordan River. And, and I think it is interesting that when they come to the Jordan River, they did not stop. Now the Jordan River was at flood stage. It was the middle of spring when it was flooded. Nobody could pass over it. When they got to the Jordan River, they did not stop at the edge of the river and say, okay, Lord, do something. The Bible says they came to the Jordan River and they stepped in. And it wasn't until the feet of the priests touched the river that God stopped the waters. We need to be about actively serving and seeking God's will instead of just sitting back and waking, waiting. If God has spoken, we need to act. We need to act. One of the problems I think that we have is that God has often told us what we need to do. We're just not willing to do it. We need to step out. You know, God's will, often knowing God's will, is kind of like a, a stairway where God only reveals one step at a time, not the whole stairway. And you won't know what the next step is going to be until you take that first one. So we need to earnestly seek God's will, attempting to step out in faith for Him. We also need to be yielded to God. Verse 8, Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. As soon as he got a word from God, he got up, and he went to Damascus and got busy doing what God had said, do. God said, go. He went. He went. All the areas of our life need to be yielded and open 
to the will of God. Folks, if there's some aspect of your life that you're just not willing to give over to God, why should God give you any direction in that area? If, if you're shutting off your relationships, your business, you're shutting off various areas of your life and saying, well, God, you can't have this, why should God give you any direction if you're not going to do it anyway? We need to be open and yielded to His will. Note also that God's guidance is very practical. God will reveal His will to us in ways that are plain to see and, and plain to understand. He used a number of methods in the Bible to reveal His will to His people. Now, of course, we see here that God reveals His will to Saul supernaturally. He uses a miracle to do this. The, uh, it is a vision of the resurrected Christ, the glorified Christ. And sometimes God does use miracles especially in the Bible. But most of the time, most of the time, God is not going to be that dramatic. Most of the time, God's going to use one of these other methods. He will speak to you through His Word, and that's the most common way that God speaks to us today. He speaks to us through His Word. God's Word holds the answer to all of His directions, all of His guidance. When you're in doubt concerning God's will, go back to the Bible and read it. It's amazing how many people will say, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I have no direction in my life. I don't know what God's will is in this. Well, have you prayed about it? Well, no, I haven't really prayed about it. Have you read the scriptures? No, I haven't been in the Word in years. Well, no wonder you haven't heard from God. He's written you a letter and you haven't read it. Start reading God's Word. Spend time in His Word. Another way that God speaks, and this is one that is tremendously overlooked today, is that God often speaks through His people. He speaks through other believers in Christ. Look at verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So God uses Ananias and the disciples at Damascus to speak his will, to communicate his will to Saul. Folks, never discount the counsel of godly people around you. Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. God speaks through his people. Have you ever wondered why we as Baptists have what we call a congregational polity? Why we vote on so many things? You ever wondered why we, we do this? why we have these parliamentary kinds of meetings? Well, the reason is because we believe that everyone who is a member of Eastside Baptist Church is a spirit-filled believer. You, if you are not a spirit-filled believer in Christ, then you shouldn't be a member in the first place. We believe if you're a member at Eastside Baptist Church, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God and that you have direct access to God. And so when we vote on something, what we're doing is we're saying, what do you as the congregation, as God's people, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, what do you perceive that God is speaking to us on this particular issue? That's what we do. And folks, as, as believers in Christ, we need to avail ourselves of that resource. We need to find some godly counselors within the body of Christ, people who are mature, growing believers in Christ, and talk to them. What do you perceive that God is saying to me in this? What kind of wisdom has God given you to share with me on this particular issue in my life? And don't discount the, the uh, advice that comes from spiritual people, godly people. I've seen it over and over where their individuals will make a decision and brothers and sisters in Christ who love them will come to them and say, you know, that, that really is probably not the best way to go. That's probably not the best decision to make. They ignore it and it's disaster. 
Seek the counsel of godly people. The biggest obstacle here, of course, is our own pride. I don't want to listen to anybody else. Now, who are you to tell me what I should do? Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. Be careful about pride in that area. Finally, God directs us through the indwelling of the Spirit. The body of Christ has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and each of us as individuals have the indwelling of the Spirit as well. And, and again, we see this in the life of Saul, verse 17. Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has come and sent me to you. And, he, and Scripture says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit after he laid hands on him. Every one of us who are believers have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. You have the, the access to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he will guide you into all truth, according to John 16, 13. One of the distinguishing marks of a Christian, one of the distinguishing marks of a Christian is that we have the earmark. We hear from the Spirit. We hear Christ speak to us through His Spirit. John 10, 1 through 14 says that if we are His sheep, we will hear His voice. God speaks to His people through the Holy Ghost. These are the resources that you have for discovering God's will for your life. God has a big plan for your life. If you know what it is, do you know what it is tonight? If not, then be meek, be teachable, be open, be yielded to God, and draw as close as you can to Christ, and He'll reveal His will to you. Listen for the leading of His Word. Listen to, to the leading of His people. Listen to the leading of His Spirit. John 14, 21 says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and manifest myself to him. Most of us, folks, I'm convinced, most of us, our problem is not so much knowing what God would have us to do. And, and I know that is the, the direction that most people take. You know, I just wish I knew what God wanted me to do. Most of the time, I'm going to suggest that's not our problem. Most of the time, our problem is that we already know what God wants us to do. We just don't want to do it. In most cases. In most cases. We need to have a yielded spirit, a meek spirit, a humble spirit, an obedient spirit that is surrendered to do the will of God. And then we will not only know His will, but we will have the empowerment to accomplish His will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your direction and guidance. We ask, Lord, that if there's any here tonight that is struggling with knowing your will and your direction for their life, we ask, Lord, that you would just give them direction and guidance tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to them in that still, small voice, that the Holy Spirit would give them guidance. And Lord, that they would hear from, from the, the wisdom of brothers and sisters in Christ who are mature and growing spiritually. And Lord, that they would hear from your word. We ask that you would guide them and direct them. And Lord, having heard from you, that they would submit to that will, that they would not only hear it, but do it. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy and kindness. Guide us and direct us now into your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for our